Welcome to the Retail Focus Podcast, a weekly collection of news, interviews, and information from the world of retail. Here are your hosts, Trent Kling and Leighton Kling. Welcome to this edition of the Retail Focus Podcast with Trent and Leighton Kling. Coming up on today's show, a little bit of everything. We talk about a couple of struggling retailers to begin the show in Pier 1 and Forever 21. But we'll talk about bullish retail or optimism in retail with another convenience store survey. We'll also talk about a couple of retailers I visited this week in different cities. And we'll discuss two different looking ahead stories, both of which interesting in their own way. A reminder to like us, rate us, however you do access us, whether that be on something like Podbean, whether that be something like Apple Podcasts or Spotify. You can also check us out on Twitter and Instagram at Retail Podcast. So we begin today's show with Pier 1, a retailer that I actually have visited not only a few Pier 1 locations, but a few distribution centers in the last couple of months. I'll talk about those experiences there, but the bottom line is they had a tough earnings call this last week. They saw a double-digit comp sales drop in the quarter. One thing to note is, although most of their store signage still says Pier 1 Imports, they have rebranded to just Pier 1 as part of their overall reinvention. This was put into place by former CEO Alastair James. We'll talk about former leadership versus current leadership here in a moment, but that's one thing we'll note is we're going to be calling them Pier 1 because they're no longer Pier 1 imports. Once upon a time, import was a differentiator phrase, no longer an unusual concept. Just look at the amount of imports in retail stores now. Pretty much everything is imported in there. Additionally, some lingering resentment surrounding imports as a whole in the U.S. among some of the population, although this wasn't explicitly mentioned by Pier 1 when making the change, of course. But before we get into the earnings call, Leighton, we wanted to provide a little bit of a background or context to this earnings call. Background is always important, and for a company like this who has had recent struggles to Trent's point, it's extremely important to maybe cover some of the past of Pier 1, and Pier 1 has been struggling over the past couple of years, certainly, as their product selection has struggled to differentiate itself against competitors, and they've seen many of the same troubles that Kirkland's has. We actually covered a Kirkland's earnings report a few weeks ago. With the exception of Kirkland's issues related to expansion, a lot of their issues has to do with maybe growing too big in such a short amount of time. Pier 1 is going basically through the opposite direction in terms of store count now, as we'll talk about here a little bit later, with over two dozen stores having been closed for the latest period. There are many competitors in this space across all of Pier 1's merchandise lines. When you look at general merchandise retailers, both Target and Walmart have strengthened their home furnishings positions over the last five years. Amazon and Wayfair, among others, are offering online alternatives with free or expedited shipping options, of course. Home goods and other off-pricers are offering alternatives at reduced price points as well. And there are top-line premium retailers such as RH, formerly Restoration Hardware, that have a hold on the higher end of this particular market niche. Things were expected to be bad, Trent, for Pier 1 in the second quarter, but perhaps not this bad. So I say all of that to introduce what we were seeing as a major highlight of the story in terms of negative comp store sales. And their comp store sales, for those of you who aren't too familiarized with Pier 1, include their e-commerce sales because of that omni-channel integration that has happened over the last 36 months or so. The same store sales trend were down 12.6% year over year, which is a definite negative. The company blamed the drop on a few different things, one of which being the heavy clearance activity. Their goal coming into the year as a whole was to drop inventory levels. Not so much in the stores, because if you think about a typical footprint of a Pier 1, they're smaller. They don't hold a lot of inventory. They have a lot of minimal inventory in the back room or pack away inventory on hand at any one time. But in the distribution centers, it has been an issue. The higher inventory levels in the distribution centers have been an issue. A lot of that gluttonous seasonal packaging comes to a point where it ends up having a heavy burden on their balance sheet. As such, they aggressively clearanced items that the company was not planning to carry forward, aka non-go-forward products. This resulted in lower margins, but also lower ticket sizes as customers opted, of course, to purchase clearance goods as compared to the full price goods in other areas of the store. 
Also, ticket size was adversely affected by the company's general repositioning that they've been talking about into a lower price point. This is the general direction that they're moving in, similar to what we saw in a stage press release this week when they're talking about positioning all of their stores to be off price. A lot of stores are seeing this as an opportunity, whether it's in apparel or in this particular case in home goods or home decor. This is part of the company's overall re-imaging program that is not just touching merchandise, but really touching the overall company strategy here with Pier 1. Finally, Trent, traffic was down. This was not unexpected, but the company does need to find a way to stem the outward flow of traffic as it appears to this point that their omni-channel initiatives and buy online, pick up in store, really haven't brought in all of the people that they had hoped. And Trent, this is a definite negative for the company coming into times where not that long ago, you and I were saying very positive things about the percentages of people coming in to shop their retail sections of the store after having made a purchase online and picking that item up. Things have definitely backed up for the retailer a little bit, and I guess one positive, there are a few positives that we'll talk about just regarding the call, but the clearancing initiatives have had their desired effect. Inventory is down 15% over last year, and again, they've never really had an issue with keeping store inventory controlled but they've had far too much stale inventory in their distribution centers, especially that out-of-date seasonal inventory that Leighton was discussing earlier. Now, as far as those clearancing initiatives are concerned, again, we talk about store inventory at a Pier 1, and really, when you look at store-based inventory at a Pier 1, honestly, for the most part, it's been pretty well in check. Stores don't really have a lot of room at Pier 1s for some of that pack-away merchandise, so they've been able to keep most of that controlled. But again, you've got areas of their distribution centers that are basically for the seasonal merchandise that is carrying over season to season. That's not a good thing for the retailer. So you've seen aggressive clearances in that regard, but aggressive clearances also for some of their higher priced merchandise. We'll talk about their pricing structures changing in a little bit. As far as other numbers for the company, Leighton talked about the comp sales. I did want to address some of the other big numbers for Pier 1. They had a net loss of $100.6 million in the quarter. That works out to an insane loss of $24.29 on a per share basis. That might just be the largest per share loss we've ever seen while doing the podcast. And it's nearly double what they saw in the second quarter last year. By the way, this number has been adjusted for their recent 1 for 20 reverse stock split this year. So that's one reason why that loss number seems so astronomical. They did that split in part to make sure that they were meeting listing guidelines as their stock had fallen below some of the listing guidelines for their markets. Now, net sales as a whole decreased by 14.3% year over year, fueled again by those terrible comps that Leighton talked about. Also by store closures. Speaking of the store closures, they've closed 38 in the past 12 months, actually forecasting higher numbers of store closures going forward. Elsewhere, gross profit as a percentage of net sales was down to 20.9% versus 29.4% a year ago. And selling general and administrative expenses as a percentage of sales, that was up 300 basis points too. The company said over and over again, hey, we brought that down on a cash basis, but the reality of it is went up on a percentage basis. Now, despite all of that, despite this poor showing, is the company truly on the right track to turn things around as their leadership group seems to believe? Well, for one, the company internally certainly isn't acting like a company on the brink of financial disaster. And to this point, as I referenced on the podcast after visits to two different Pier 1 distribution centers this summer, their seasonal hiring actually isn't being done on a temporary basis this year. They're finding that they're getting much more buy-in from employees when they don't bring them in on a temp basis, but when they bring them on as full-time employees with those benefits. The idea is they can keep those employees around when the year turns over on into January, February, and the like. So again, that's not something you see very often from companies that are struggling financially. We actually saw a couple of press releases this week about holiday season hiring tapering downward, and that's just not the case with Pier 1, at least as far as those distribution centers are concerned. Furthermore, in terms of those back-end improvements, the company's made a lot of improvements to their facilities. I was able to tour their Columbus, Ohio facility 
And honestly, it is a gorgeous distribution center. They've been able to work in the distribution center, which distributes to stores, and the fulfillment center, which distributes directly to customers that have ordered on the website, all under one roof. And it is an enormous facility, basically rebuilt because they're combining facilities there into one in Columbus. They used to have two different facilities there in Columbus, combining them into one. And honestly, you're seeing a company on the back end of things that is making investments. They're making investments towards human capital. They're making investments towards some of those distribution mechanisms. And they need to do so because right now, if a customer orders from the online shop at Pier 1 and has it delivered to their address, it might take 7 to 10 days to get that product to them. And when you compare that to a competitor, online competitor like Amazon or Wayfair, that's just not going to cut it. And I kind of asked some people with the company, you know, is it a possibility that you might eventually start to fulfill from the stores themselves? And they said, hey, not going to rule anything out, but that's very difficult to do because the stores don't have a lot of room for inventory individually. So it would take basically a reimagining of their brick and mortar space to be able to do this. I do want to reference one of the quotes from their executive vice president and CFO, Bob Reisbeck. He mentioned that, hey, basically they feel like they're continuing to execute against the cost initiatives under their 2020 action plan. That's for fiscal year 2020. By the way, they're in fiscal year 2020 right now. And he felt like his teams overall did a good job of controlling expenses during the quarter. And they feel like this is the big one. They have sufficient liquidity, and that is a quote, to achieve their fiscal 2020 goals. Most of these goals have to do with reimagining the business. So all of this put in mind here in terms of that liquidity, that's such a big topic because, again, you need that liquidity to put in those capital investments. It seems as though the company is very focused on doing that, and I think that's something that I like. You know, We talk about Sears and the decline of Sears talked about it on a regular basis over the last four years on the podcast, and those improvements internally were the first things to go when you saw Sears struggling financially. Not the case here with Pier 1, and I think that's a positive. So given all of this, what's the vision that their CEO, Cheryl Batchelder, has for the company going forward? Well, interestingly, I look back to a release they sent out in April as a response to an S&P report critical of the company's future liquidity, which again, their CFO just said, hey, we've got plenty of. The company actually, and this is very rare when you see this in a press release, the company said that there were struggles in implementing their so-called, what they call their New Day program, which is kind of their re-imaging, the re-imagining of Pier 1. That's when they dropped the imports from the name. And they said there were struggles in that program, but those were due in large part to issues with prior leadership. It's interesting because in the press release, they basically threw Alice Dare James under the bus, the prior CEO, saying like, hey, Old leadership wasn't really equipped there, and the release said, and I quote, they have since put in place a capable team, end quote. So you really don't see that too much in retail, even if the prior team didn't do a very good job in implementing a plan. You rarely see them thrown under the bus like that, although that release did reference no borrowings on a revolving credit line and $55 million in cash and short-term investments at the end of the prior fiscal year. Now, in the six months since, despite what the CFO says, that has changed somewhat. They only had $10 million in cash on hand, and it extended their borrowings on the revolving line to over $50 million. So things have noticeably declined in the liquidity area, but they do have still around $300 million available on that revolving line of credit. Now, I want to go back to the company's initial New Day strategy presentation. This took place little over a year ago. They underscored the need to reposition their price point to provide more of a value proposition. And Leighton, this was noted as their competition was growing both comp sales and store count at the time. Competition in this presentation, meaning the likes of home goods who operate in that value segment. To this end, Batchelder says she believes customers will see, and I quote, a different Pier 1 heading into the back half of the year and the holiday season, confident that they will have overturned their merchandise mix and are now ready to compete on price as well, as Trent just said. This was especially noted in the fall harvest area as they got new merchandise to stores in August and are actually seeing positive signs as a result of that. In fact, the five days surrounding Labor Day actually show a positive comp over last year, which is good for the company, one which the company said was driven by marketing for a promotion and by the new merchandise mix as well. She trumpeted savings in SGNA, but again, those savings are in terms of dollars 
as a percentage of revenue, SG&A again is up. In time for the holidays, they've retained a new ad agency to assist with delivering the message of the transformation to their consumers. A wise move by the company, in our opinion, as their message has been a bit muddled to this point if you aren't already a regular customer. Finally, they are continuing to work with ANG Realty, a company we've discussed in the past on the podcast, in order to attempt to work with landlords and in this case, between the landlords who own the Pier 1 real estate to reduce rents, trying to negotiate rents, maybe get some early extensions in there that benefit the bottom line of the Pier 1 company. In the interim, they've set sights on closing 70 stores in the fiscal year, an uptick from past closures. In theory, Trent, a g Realty will work with potential new tenants to assume leases, as they've done with so many struggling retailers in the past. Super curious to see how that is working out for them. It's not just going to be Pier 1 that's going to be trying to be proactive in terms of lease negotiations and trying to maybe set forth their real estate plans in terms of maybe finding which stores are going to work for the future and which ones aren't. But it is really go time for Pier 1 in terms of the operations side of the house. You can see that them losing as much money as they are quarter after quarter, something needs to happen in order to stem those losses and to get right back on track in line with their merchandise mix strategy. Although this is something we noted speculation on a few weeks ago, it looks as though Forever 21 may indeed have real estate-based suitors. We discussed this about four months ago on the podcast, along with the pros and cons of REITs taking stakes in major tenants who have a history of struggling. It appears as though two REITs in particular are being tied to Forever 21 now as the retailer speeds towards what appears to be a likely bankruptcy. This, by the way, via a report from Bloomberg. Ironically, the same report says that Forever 21 is potentially not interested in any such buy-in from Simon Property Group and Brookfield, the two rumored suitors who, by the way, of course, own a ton of malls throughout the United States. Indeed, the resistance comes from Forever 21 co-founder Do Wan Chang, who would like to retain control of the company. It is admittedly a tough situation for Chang. Again, founder of the company, helped the company rise to prominence, but they are now in a free fall. So tough to put aside ego for the benefit of the company, but they do need to do something now in order to help the company's position. I think it's inevitable that something's going to happen with Forever 21 with all of the rumors that we've been seeing from major media outlets. Not necessarily, as Bloomberg reports, is this going to be the case as a result of disagreement in leadership, a group of Forever 21 officials have actually approached the REITs themselves to seek a deal without Chang's consent. This is interesting as internal disconsent often follows financial struggles, so this is really no surprise to us. And that said, the deal is reportedly structured so that Chang would at least retain some share in the company, some ownership stake, that is. The internal ownership of the company has always been important to Forever 21. And if you look, even on their website to this day, they trumpet the fact that it remains a family-owned business. Because it is privately held, because it is somewhat family-owned, we don't know the exact extent of the financial struggles, but various news outlets keep saying that the company could file bankruptcy pretty much any day now. And this is echoed by Bloomberg, who says bankruptcy could come as soon as the beginning of October. That's just a couple weeks from now. The idea behind any proposal from Simon and Brookfield would likely include reduced rents in exchange for shares of the company. Again, Trent, we discussed this on a podcast a few weeks back, but because Forever 21 stores average 38,000 square feet, those are pretty substantial mall stores, there's a bit more urgency on the part of the shopping center owners to keep them open and alive. On Simon's most recent earnings call, in fact, CEO David Simon said that the company made a ton of money as a result of the Aeropostale deal, a similar deal to that uh, that is proposed here with Forever 21. It was actually brokered in 2016. It's difficult, however, to tell what is meant by David Simon's statements, whether they effectively made more money because the stores did not close and or... They uh, made money because of the turnaround at Aeropostal. Still, it really speaks to my earlier point made about Aeropostal likely not hemorrhaging a whole lot of money because that would have shown up on Simon's earnings calls if there were a notable loss. So perhaps it was a coming together of the two, Aeropostal sticking around, paying rents to Simon, and being a competent business model. 
And there are some out there, like analyst Jan Rogers Niffen, who is cited in an article this week in National Real Estate Investor, that seem to suggest that it's a win-win for REITs to invest this way. They can buy into the business at a reduced price. Again, business on the verge of bankruptcy, a lot of debt out there. If it takes off, then great. If not, they have leverage to manage liquidations in an orderly fashion that benefits them, basically saying, hey, we can liquidate stores either out of our own portfolio that we own or out of other mall operators' portfolios as we go. It gives them a little bit of time to plan through succession plans for those spaces. But that said, as we've discussed on past podcasts, there is a downside to this. By putting more eggs in the apparel basket, REITs are basically keeping their shopping centers from diversification. And when I talk about this, I talk about it more from the perspective of Simon, because let's be honest, when we look at Simon's portfolio versus Brookfield's portfolio, kind of a different set. It's almost like comparing apples and oranges. Brookfield has a lot of residential portfolios, has a lot of office portfolios. Most of their holdings are considered to be A or B class malls. And you look at some of the the redevelopments that Brookfield is going through. They actually just had their Investor Day presentation this week, and I was fortunate enough to, to get a copy of that there. But basically, you look at a lot of their properties, and even the properties that are currently in a B class, like the Cumberland Mall in Atlanta, Georgia, I was actually just there not but three or four weeks ago. They have plans to redevelop it back into an A class property. Massive redevelopment and rezoning processes underway for those particular properties. And adding offices, hotels, and the like to those type of properties. Then you look at other areas like the Stonestown Galleria in San Francisco, California, already an A-class property there, but they feel like there's a potential to unlock a lot more. I say all of that to say this. Brookfield is much more in tune with updating their properties and getting them diversified and Looking at Simon's properties, a little bit less so there. Quite honestly, a lot of Simon's properties are marked by the fact that they do have a lot of B and even some C-class malls still in their portfolio. So again, by just buying into Forever 21, Simon might be keeping those shopping centers from diversification, at least in the short term. Ultimately, the deal, as suggested by Bloomberg, does seem to bring a net benefit for the REITs involved. In the course of a bankruptcy, businesses, of course, are at risk of just ending leases without much in the way of settlement or ramification. We saw this earlier this year when Shopco went bankrupt. A lot of landlords were stuck basically holding the lease, and now they've got empty buildings with which not a lot can be done in those small to mid-sized markets. Now, if any such deal were to go through, and again, a lot of this speculation, a lot of this reporting from Bloomberg, and it still has to be approved by all parties involved. The best case scenario in our belief is that Simon and Brookfield run Forever 21 stores until which time they can court new tenants for the spaces or figure out a redivision of the spaces. Personally, I don't see a long-term future for Forever 21 at their current footprint. I think 38,000 square feet as an average square footage is a little bit large for what Forever 21 has become. So it's going to be up to Simon or Brookfield or another company if they happen to be bought out by a different firm or themselves basically to cut down on that square footage and become more efficient. And to that point, you know, an interesting contrarian viewpoint in terms of maybe not working this deal from the REIT side comes via Nick Egalanian, who is the president of SiteWorks Retail Real Estate Services. And he was quoted in National Real Estate Investor as saying that Simon and Brookfield's potential investment in Forever 21 wouldn't address what actually ails the retailer, which again comes back to that inefficiency, comes back to the oversized square footage. And he says basically it's kind of an unnecessary panic move. He doesn't say that verbatim, but he kind of indicates that. He says, and I quote, saving inefficient and duplicative retailers like Forever 21 is not a sound long-term strategy. It's nothing more than a temporary band-aid. And Honestly, that's where I feel like he's got a valid point, because Forever 21, there are a lot of retailers in these type of malls very similar to Forever 21. There's not a differentiator there. Although the brand is strong, you've got so many of those apparel retailers there. How do you move from those apparel retailers, like what we're seeing a lot of A-class malls do, to the more experiential brand of retail? Well, it's probably not being done by propping up Forever 21 long-term, and 
The reason he makes this point in particular is because of the continued success of A-Class properties to realign their offerings for the consumer. He mentions in this article that, you know, hey, there's still a lot of misunderstanding out there about the relative success of these A-Class malls. These A-Class malls are still seeing success. Their overall vacancy rates are still low compared to the B and C-Class malls. And again, this point becomes very salient for Brookfield because Simon is the one that has the holdings of the B and C class malls. So because Simon's been a bit behind in adjusting their overall portfolio based on market fluctuations, they might need this deal with Forever 21 to keep them afloat more than Brookfield does. But again, A class malls, the theory here, could basically find a new tenant or new tenants, multiple of them, that could potentially draw even more traffic than a stale Forever 21. Not saying that they're stale now, but over time, if they do become that way, you're basically reducing the value of the property if you're not doing your due diligence to get businesses in there that are going to drive traffic. And by doing that, you're not really setting yourself up for more long-term success. Brookfield's MO has been all about redevelopment, has been all about, hey, what can we do to make these properties that are in great neighborhoods, that are in great shopping centers, what can we do to upgrade those? Maybe they're A minus, maybe they're B. What can we do to upgrade those to an A class mall? And Brookfield is one of the ones that has been on the forefront of redeveloping the old Sears stores that have closed down. So a lot going on here as far as that redevelopment quandary. And as such, based on Egalanian's comments, the deal might be better suited for Simon than Brookfield. Again, higher percentage of their portfolio in A class properties. Maybe such a deal would keep Brookfield back from redeveloping some of these properties like they've been able to do in multiple other cities. It's just something to think about. And again, this deal may never go through because, again, you're talking about the head co-founder of the company being fundamentally opposed to it, even though he would retain an ownership stake. But again, just a lot going on here with this particular deal. And you wonder if this does open up the floodgates for landlords to buy stakes in failing companies. We kick off the next half of the podcast with a quick discussion on, uh, again, retailers that we visited over the last week or a couple of weeks here. And Layton, I'll let you get to yours here in a second, but I visited a couple of different cities this week, one being St. Louis and the other being Baltimore. And as I often do when I visit cities, I always look at kind of the grocery scene there. We talked about this a week ago on the podcast in my visits to Phoenix, Arizona. When I went to St. Louis, one of the retailers I was excited to visit there was a grocery store operator called Chinooks. And Chinooks has been around now for quite some time. They actually had holdings more diverse than just in the St. Louis area. They had several stores in the Kansas City metro area into Kansas, several stores up into Illinois. So they were a little bit more spread out. They have, however, concentrated their holdings now to where most of them are focused just around the St. Louis metro area. And in most cases, you look at that and say, well, that's a grocery retailer that might be struggling to kind of keep up with the Joneses there. But in Chinook's case, it seems to have worked out. It seems to have been a valid move for them. So I was excited to visit. This is the first time I've been to St. Louis in about five to six years. And the Chinook stores are as good as ever. They're very high class grocery stores. They've all got a very nice design on the outside. This is a market where you don't see a lot of Walmart neighborhood markets out there. You don't see a whole lot of larger national chains. You see a few other retailers in the grocery space like Deerberg's, for example. So the grocery area in St. Louis is a little bit different, but for Chinooks, really like what they've done, especially folding in organic. Merchandising was fantastic in these stores, and these stores were very busy. So I felt like that was an interesting approach for them. Just looking historically, again, they've kind of focused on a concentrated area, an area where they've got that brand equity, and it seems to be working for them. Now, as far as my visit to Baltimore, what I really wanted to tie in with this visit to Baltimore is that a story came out. We kind of foreshadowed this several months ago, but Wegmans is opening up their 100th store this weekend. This weekend that we're recording the podcast, slated to open up on September 29th, uh, 2019. This 100th store is in the ever-filled market of North Carolina right there in the Research Triangle. But I actually went to a newer Wegmans while I was in Baltimore. This location was just north of the Baltimore area in the area called the Hunt Valley. 
interesting thing about this is it was actually adjacent to a giant store run by Shop and Save there. But this Wegman store, really our question was, hey, they're expanding further south from their typical locations in upstate New York. Can they differentiate themselves in newer markets? I was really impressed by what I saw at this Wegmans. Now, I was there later at night, so it wasn't all that busy, but just the sheer amount of ready-to-eat food that they had there, which is consistent with their other locations throughout, whether it be upstate New York or their typical footprint, uh, that was really impressive. And again, this is a newer build-out for Wegmans, this particular store. You could tell the focus on the ready-to-eat food was ever present in this location. Basically, going through the aisles, I would say a good third of the store was devoted to ready-to-eat food or fresh market food. And again, took several pictures. We'll get this up on our Instagram page. But I think that's really the answer here is because you've got a market like Baltimore that has giant stores. They've got other stores there in that Baltimore market that are there competing for market share. And I think Wegman's trying to stand out on that ready-to-eat food front, trying to stand out on the, the take-home meals offerings, if you will, as well. However, overall, I just found the store, again, incredibly merchandised. Is it enough long-term to stand out, especially in an area like the Research Triangle, where you do have, to our point on an earlier podcast, you've got other stores there, Harris Teeter, Kroger, Publix moving north, of course, is, is now there. So you've got so many other competitors. Can you stand out from those? And I think they're putting their best foot forward. But again, it's going to take a lot to completely differentiate themselves, especially from a brand like Publix, who more people in North Carolina might actually be familiar with than Wegmans. I think you're looking at an area in Baltimore where, yeah, a lot of people are probably going to be aware of Wegmans because of their standing in the New York area, ranging on south into Pennsylvania. But again, overall, it just matters as far as how they differentiate themselves. And I kind of worry that Wegmans might be spreading themselves a little bit too thin because honestly, not a lot of white space out there in the grocery market, particularly in the research triangle. So definitely kind of a combo looking ahead, but I was very impressed by this particular location in Baltimore. Overall, my retail experiences in the last week were generally pretty positive, especially in the grocery sector. If you had a guess, Trent, where I went or what my retail story is, what would you guess? I would guess you went to Kmart. That is exactly right. And for those listeners out there, I absolutely love going into Kmart's. has that nostalgic feeling, and there are still Kmart's out there that I have not visited, which is kind of interesting because there are, are, I believe, less than 250 left in the United States. The Kmart I visited was after a nice hike in the L.A. National Forest. The Kmart was in Europa Valley, California, which is actually Riverside, California. So it's a bit inland, but it was only about 35 minutes south of the L.A. National Forest. And so I decided to visit it because I hadn't visited it in the past. And it's one of the only remaining Kmarts in that particular region. So back in the day, Kmart used to dominate this region. The inland area had Kmart spread out everywhere. And I'll get into that in just a little bit. But first, I visited this Kmart. It's interesting because the retail dynamic over where this Kmart was, it was a thriving new age retail center where you would see a Chipotle, you would see a Buffalo Wild Wings and a lot of other retail centers, fitness clubs, those kinds of things. But this Kmart was actually kind of tucked away from that. It was a little bit offset from the road. So you had to really look for it a little bit. So I think that is one drawback for this particular Kmart. But overall, that caused it to be fairly easy in terms of parking. There were plenty of stalls open inside the Kmart Trent. It was actually one of the cleanest Kmarts I had been in for quite some time. It was actually reminiscent of the Kmart that you and I had visited a couple of years ago when we went to the NRF conference in September of, I believe, 2016 it was, where the Burbank Kmart was extremely clean. There were customers shopping. It was a very well-trafficked location. This was no different. There were Customers, there were actually lines at the the point of sale where people had to be directed towards then the return area where people then could make their purchases. So uh, a very well-trafficked Kmart, a clean Kmart. However, I will say that they did downsize a little bit. They did close off the garden center, but overall the merchandising was very strong. I feel like as strong as a Kmart's merchandising could be, they had end caps well-stocked, the pods were well-stocked. And this was one of the first times I'd actually seen what I referenced previously on a Kmart story as a blowout sale. So typically you'll be familiarized with blue light specials, but they had blowout sales where 
merchandise was up to 60% off of MSRP. And in this particular case, I found several good buys on items in their food section. So I bought a few bags of chips that were marked 50% off. I found this to be a very good deal. And it was actually shocking to me because, again, I hadn't seen too many of these sales in the past, but these blowout sales were everywhere within this particular store location. I wonder if that's a new strategy that they're going towards. Certainly something that they need to have to entice customers to even enter a Kmart in the first place. I, I will forget before I move on that the automatic door, the, the, there's several front doors typically in a Kmart location, as many of our listeners may remember, but the automatic door that would lead you inside the store was actually broken. So you actually had to use the door that you have to push open, and that was also almost broken. So they should probably fix that if they want customers to have a more pleasant experience. But other than that, Trent, a very, again, clean store, well-trafficked, good overall experience. I loved it. I spent about 40 minutes in there, and I gave Kmart about $10 of my money for their efforts. Uh, I bought those food items. But what was interesting is that just two miles north of this Kmart, there was another Kmart. No, it was not opened. It was dead. But that was adjacent to a new Walmart that had been built not that long ago. It was a super center, huge Walmart. And so, of course, the evolution of retail tells us that the Walmart beats the Kmart and thus the closure of that particular Kmart. But it really speaks to the density that Kmart had in this particular area just not that long ago. I was excited to see that this particular Kmart in Europa Valley was still in existence. If anyone wants to visit it, again, it's in Riverside, California. And I spoke to the manager there, an assistant sales manager, and he said that, you know, they are pretty optimistic about the Kmart, but because of the recent slate of closures, they are never safe. They are in a mentality now that they could close any day. And that is not what you want your employees to feel as they're working hard day after day to at least maintain a decent store presence. We go back to the news portion of the Retail Focus podcast as we discuss the latest quarterly numbers from the National Association of Convenience Stores. It shows continued bullishness among C-Store operators. This is a natural follow-up to our earlier discussion about four months ago about C-Stores being fairly optimistic about the summer and the third quarter. That optimism turned out to be well-founded. Just as a background here, NACS typically does quarterly or seasonal polls of their membership regarding sales expectations and also estimates of sales for their most recent quarter. The sample size is fairly robust, although this was a touch higher for the second quarter survey than it was for this survey. For this survey that we'll discuss on today's episode, there were 2,906 stores represented, so still quite a few stores across 118 different companies or brands, so still a fairly significant cross-section as it pertains to the year-to-date 74% of convenience store retailers say that in-store merchandise sales were up over the first nine months of the year. In-store sales, of course, are more our focus on the podcast since a variety of other macroeconomic factors may affect gasoline sales and gasoline markups. That being said, just over half did report fuel sales being higher to this point in the year. Only 10% of locations reported a sales decline year over year in the first nine months of 2019. Again, this dovetails nicely with prior surveys, which showed convenience store retailers being rather bullish about their prospects for this year. As for optimism heading into the fourth quarter, it's sitting at 84%. In other words, 84% of operators surveyed are optimistic about their sales in the fourth quarter. Optimism is always a tricky thing when you're measuring that in the form of a survey because it means different things for some than others. In this case, we can extrapolate that this means generally positive sales trends for those retailers surveyed, but some people see optimism as maintaining sales from a prior year. Others see it as exceeding sales from a prior year. The percentage of C-Store operators that are optimistic about this coming quarter, that's up 1% sequentially, and it's up several points since last year at the same time. The survey also indicated that major concerns for C-Stores seem to be centered around common issues for the industry, weather and oil prices. Oil prices, of course, in the last month have been fluctuating a little bit, of course, with worries about Middle Eastern politics and Middle Eastern conditions. That said, we discussed on last week's show the expectation by some analysts of a warmer winter weather-wise into the fourth quarter, and this might mean increased sales for convenience stores 
since there's a pretty widely accepted direct correlation between warmer weather and those increased in-store sales. Some of this, of course, is fueled by children being out of school during summer and vacationers during the summer, granted, but it's said to have a positive effect among other demographics at other times of the year as well. So it's kind of that conundrum. Its correlation doesn't necessarily equal causation, but you do see a little bit of a correlation there between warmer weather, even in the winter, and those increased in-store sales. People are more likely to venture inside for things like beverages or snacks when the weather isn't horrendous outside. Now, what is interesting is that despite optimism in their own operations, Fewer of these stores are optimistic of the industry as a whole, just 78% compared to 83% in their own operations. Also, 77% of them are confident in the economy as a whole. That was a slight drop from the prior quarter, so less overall bullishness, but people are pretty self-confident at this point in terms of those convenience store operators. Each time these surveys are conducted, the NACS asks a series of other questions. These questions change In nearly every poll, last quarter, we learned that the healthy food and beverage options were becoming major traffic drivers for convenience stores, and they anticipate an increase in healthy options in stores as time progresses. This quarter, they asked about day parts that fuel sales growth. According to the survey, Trent, 62% of the retailers surveyed said that the morning day part between 6 a.m. and 11 a.m. was the most important period for fueling sales growth. Again, this makes sense as we've seen the effects from this line of thinking with extended coffee and warm beverage options for those heading into work. Also, generally speaking, over the last 10 years or so, we've seen convenience stores make a concerted effort to expand selections of morning pastries and donuts, the likes of Quick Trip, let's say, 7-Eleven, and of course, Casey's General Store, all investing in expanding these particular lines. After day parts, the survey asked about in-store traffic drivers. This was interesting. No surprise, 57% of customers said that beverages were the main reason that they came into the store. People still love beverages, either the conventional sugary beverages or the aforementioned coffee drinks. This was followed by 23% saying that they come in for food, 18% for other, super curious as to that other because general merchandise is fairly low in terms of the product mix. While we are on this subject, it will be noteworthy to see how the recent governmental and societal backlash against e-cigarette or vaping providers will affect convenience store sales as many C-stores heavily advertise products from Juul and similar companies. Actually, this is a very good point, Trent, because I just drove by a 7-Eleven a couple days ago advertising for Juul, a huge poster on the window akin to what we would see maybe 15, 20 years ago advertising for big tobacco. Of course, We heard Trump say that he would seek a ban on certain types of vaping products, and Juul has come under fire for allegedly seeking out an underage customer base. And actually, they just settled. Juul and another company in the state of California just settled a lawsuit, again, from the state of California, claiming that they were trying to identify younger demographics and targeting them for marketing campaigns. That said, we've seen significant investment into vaping and e-cigarette providers, This has parlayed itself into a larger variety of products available in convenience stores. How will C-stores respond? That is the question. We've already heard anecdotal reports of certain C-stores pulling Juul products from their shelves. Of course, this wouldn't have been the case for the store that I drove by, but this is an interesting step for those retailers trying to be proactive because C-stores do sell a significant amount of tobacco product, and they weren't exactly pulling those from the shelves after similar accusations against tobacco companies in the 80s and 90s and ever since then, pretty much. My time at Sam's Club taught me one thing. Cigarette sales were pretty much still extremely strong in the convenience store space and made up a large percentage of their revenue if you talk to those managers. All of that is to say this, that 18% of consumers coming in for the other products What are those products? How many of them are actually coming in for vaping supplies, let's say? How many of those will be either dissuaded from vaping or how many stores will actually cut back on vaping products offered because of the bad PR or the customer sentiment? And will any of this affect C-store sales in the long run or will people just find another vice? Because this is the broader question here. If people are coming in for vaping products or still tobacco products, are they parlaying those products? purchases into other items throughout the store? Are their primary drivers going to be vaping products? And then perhaps they're going to be buying food along with that. And if they don't come in for those vaping products, 
are those customers, are those same customers still going to be coming in for that food merchandise? Speaking of this, a bill would increase the tobacco purchase age to 21. That is passed in the Senate in Pennsylvania. In theory, this would provide a hindrance to those selling tobacco products. Again, mainly C stores in this particular case. Something that gets glossed over from time to time is that retailers, Walgreens, for example, already have a 21 year age requirement on tobacco products. Although Pennsylvania is the state in the news of this week, several states, 18 in all, have already moved to set tobacco purchasing age up to 21 years, including retail powerhouse states such as New York and of course, Ohio. Trent State, Colorado, the beautiful state of Colorado, is also considering similar legislation. And when I visited you, Trent, last month, I heard that exact thing. There is a massive push amongst the public, amongst the general consumer, to push that age requirement up. You have to think that these laws are probably more detrimental to the bottom line of C-stores than the movements to ban certain products, as the stores would then need to find revenue replacements, of course, for 18 to 20-year-olds as more states pass these laws. And again, with time, this is a movement that has been going on for some time now. It wouldn't be surprising to see this type of law passed in the majority of states within the next few years. And this is something, Trent, that we have talked outside of the podcast recording about. Seeing a totally different landscape with tobacco products in the next four to five years is my assumption. Even still, C-store operators are bullish on their in-store sales and seem to be doing an increasingly better job at providing a more compelling retail case for their customers. As always, we may have a position in or against companies we discuss on the podcast. Do not invest in stocks solely on the input of the podcast hosts. We've reached the final segment of the Retail Focus Podcast, a segment we always call Looking Ahead, where each Slayton and I take a story that we're looking ahead to over the next week, month, or year, just to see how it'll pan out. And we begin with Layton. My story is going to be fairly short. And Trent, I appreciate you having talk to me about this story earlier in this week. News rolled out this week that IKEA is coming out with a store that is going to be a pseudo omni-channel format, pseudo small business format where you can just take items and go without actually having to visit a huge warehouse in the back to pick up your goods. This store is actually going to be slated for Queens, New York next summer. IKEA Queens, they're calling it, will feature thousands of products. And a lot of these products are carried in their conventional stores as it is now. However, again, they're not going to have to go back to the back of the warehouse to get them. It's going to be on the shelf. Additionally, with the omni-channel aspect, there's going to be several items that are going to be put together. So in display format that you can look, peruse, touch, feel, get the sense of, and then buy online. So that's going to be the omni-channel piece of it where customers can really find what they want, execute on that decision making, and then purchase it on IKEA's website. And if you look at some of the quotes from, let's say, the president and chief sustainability officer for IKEA Retail US, he said it's an exciting time for IKEA as they enter a new phase of their expansion into major cities in the US. And I think this is major news, and this is why it's my looking ahead, Trent. This is New York City, where the price per square foot, or let's say not only the cost per square foot in real estate, but to lease a parcel of land or a building is extremely high. It's densely populated. It's hard to get in. It's hard to find good retail areas that aren't already taken, those well-coveted areas, let's say. This is important because this new concept brings to light the fact that they're only going to be utilizing 115,000 square foot space. A lot of people would say, uh, what's wrong with you guys? 115,000 square feet is a massive store. No, no, it is not. The IKEA conventional format is over 300,000 square feet, and that doesn't take into account some of the warehouse space. So you're looking at almost a third of the size of a conventional IKEA format, and that's why it's so big. And that's why I quoted the chief sustainability officer for IKEA Retail US, because this is more about the transition of sustainability than it is, let's say, a new omni-channel format that's going to be evolved with the times. I think this is going to be more about having a lot of different things under a much smaller footprint in order to be efficient, in order to get the job done, drive the same amount of revenue 
with less overhead costs. And I think that's what it means to be a, a sustainable business is to be able to drive strong revenues, but then reduce those expenses along with that. Within this particular center in Queens, they're going to have, again, the usual products and services, but they're also going to have a food-to-go area and a family-friendly area, like a rest area where people can play with their kids, similar to what they have now in their conventional stores, let's say, by where I live in Orange County or Los Angeles County. And it's interesting, they did quote that there are 900,000 households that are going to be serviced by this store trend. That is going to be a win guaranteed because if you think about all of those families that need to maybe have a home restoration project or, or just looking for simple home decor items that you can just quickly grab and go, that is a win-win, both for the market, the immediate population there where they're wanting to shop, and then also for Ikea as far as having a strong business model going forward. They said this is one of many different concepts they're trying out. They're actually trying out what's called a planning studio on uh, New York's Upper East Side as well. And they're planning to spread those throughout the country as well where people can get together, look at different items that they want to purchase online. Again, more of an omni-channel concept there, more of a showroom concept, if you will, akin to maybe what RH has been doing throughout the country. But again... It really talks about the evolution, not only retail, but Ikea as a business, because for so long, as we all know, they stood by their over 300,000 square foot concept and, and stood by it firmly. And so I think this is going to be a good evolution for not only Ikea, but it's going to be a very positive thing for those local customers. And to your point, Leighton, I do see a market there for a more convenient IKEA because going to one of those 300,000 square foot stores for smaller items can be a bit onerous. It's difficult sometimes to navigate the stores because of the way they are laid out because they're designed to be laid out sequentially. So we'll see how that store does there in Queens. My looking ahead story, well, we're about a month away from Halloween and the National Retail Federation released their annual Halloween sales projection survey that was conducted by Prosper Insights and Analytics. And what's interesting is, you know, we talked about on last week's show, holiday sales projecting to be up, while Halloween sales this year projected to decline slightly from $86.79 billion, which was a record last year, to $86.27 billion. So a slight decline there. Part of this is because fewer people actually plan on celebrating. About 172 million people this year, down from 175 million last year. I've got a good friend of mine who's also a listener to the, in the podcast, and he always talks about the dynamics surrounding Halloween retail. And one thing that he messaged me about months ago was the fact that there was this kind of Halloween creep that you were already starting to see some of these Halloween retailers set up shop. So we've talked before about the real estate dynamics between the retailers like Spirit Halloween and Halloween Express, and even to a certain extent Halloween City, which is an extension of Party City, as they kind of slide into vacant retail spaces to set things up. Well, this is something he was noticing a little bit earlier on in the season this year, and you wonder if that's as a mechanism to try and control for the fact that spending this year or celebration of Halloween this year might be a little bit down. To that point, I think the most interesting part of the survey to me was where the customers will go to shop. 42% of shoppers said they will go to a discount store, 36% to a specialty Halloween or costume store. But what I was most impressed with, and, and by the way, the survey wasn't exclusive, so they didn't ask just one place they were going, they asked all the places they were going. But what's interesting is 25% they said they would shop online. Okay, you got that. Another 25% are expected to go to a grocery store. 23% will visit a department store. So don't expect department stores typically to be all that high in the Halloween market. We do expect discount stores or general merchandise retailers, the likes of Target, Walmart, even Dollar General and Dollar Tree to be pretty high up there. But I think the grocery store number was a little bit more interesting to me because you figure, yeah, of course, they're going to be going to those grocery stores to pick up candy, but you're starting to see a little bit more of a footprint, especially in larger grocery stores, stores like Kroger, for example, of actually including those costumes in the grocery stores to make it kind of a Halloween one-stop shop. The Kroger marketplace nearest me, and of course those are their larger square footage stores, they've balloted out almost about 
4,000 to 5,000 square feet just on Halloween seasonal outside of candy. So that's not inclusive of candy. So they've got a massive section of their store that is set aside for costumes, for decorations, as they try to kind of slip into that market. So overall, the reason I'm looking ahead is how much of a dent can discount stores and grocery stores make on those specialty stores? Because overall, the business model of those specialty Halloween stores is that it will be profitable enough to set up for that three months or so period of time, sign a shorter lease in what had been a vacant retail property, and go from there. But we've talked about the dynamics here where, yeah, vacant retail properties are available, but sometimes not available in all the best locations now. So a lot going on there, and will it be profitable enough for, say, Party City to continue with the Halloween City in the future? Mainly what I'll be looking forward to as far as measuring this, as far as a barometer of this, are the earnings releases of not only the general merchandise retailers, but also the grocers, and then finally, Party City, because you have those companies like Spirit Halloween and Halloween Express. Those aren't publicly traded companies. So Party City, really the one glimpse that we'll get into those specialty Halloween stores and how they fare for this Halloween season. Well, that'll do it for us here on the Retail Focus Podcast. For Leighton, I'm Trent saying so long until next time. We'll be back with you about seven days from now. This has been the Retail Focus Podcast. For more, visit our website at retailfocuspodcast.com and subscribe on iTunes or Stitcher. Follow us on Twitter at Retail Podcast.